We got a great episode for you today. Back into the divisional breakdowns with a lot to talk about, including Javante Williams at the top with some news and a whole lot more. Don't miss a minute. Unless one has an affinity for looking ridiculously foolish, it is wise not to stumble aimlessly into a fantasy football draft. The Ultimate Draft Kit from the Fantasy Footballers contains all the information you need to avoid the jeers of your enemies and to snuff out any glint of hope in their souls. Imagine the gasps those trouser-wearing turnips will emit as you make yet another triumphant draft selection. Imagine their tears forming a formidable puddle as you assemble an unstoppable force. The Ultimate Draft Kit comes bursting at the seams with fantasy goodness. When you enter the draft room, you'll feel as if you were a monstrous beast let loose in a chicken coop. Head over to UltimateDraftKit.com today. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Oh, welcome in. The Fantasy Footballers Podcast, Tuesday, July 11th. And I got to admit something, I'm a little on edge today. Oh, what's going on? Well, if you glance over in the direction of Deucer's Alley, which uh, we try not to do very often. It's, but It's light. But if you look over there, uh, look, uh, I my relationship to Jay Grizz is... <gasps> It's changing tremendously these days. Yeah. Is that because he insists that we call him Jay Riz now? No, that's not it, Mike. Think that, it is, that doesn't help. Yeah, that's pretty ridiculous, Jay. But um, I think it's more a matter of the bear problems we've been having in our lives. Oh, yeah. Which is just, yeah. That's just on, not a sentence most people have to say. On, no. On Bearstagram. <laughs> um, well, you see, what happened was is the algo got you. Yeah, like uh, we we go up north here in Arizona, which believe it or not, I know that the storylines that have been, you know, all over Twitter has been the magma hot days that yeah. we have been having. Which, yeah, you go up north so that it can be only 100. Yeah, 90 to 100, which is just right. And so you go up north a couple hours and, and we have a lot of wooded areas. And I had heard my whole life that there were bears. Never seen one. 39 years of life, never seen a bear. In the last... Three months, the bears are the bears are back in town. Yes, and we've had big bears crossing uh, property up there. We've had bear bears, attacks. Yeah, breaking into houses, going back into houses. I mean, bears are are going eating people. I mean, it's a uh, it's a real bad it's yeah. a real bad problem. Baby bears roaming around, uh, scouting. I'm assuming they're just looking for places to play. Uh, they are really cute. They're rambunctious. That, that's the problem. The baby yeah. bears are really cute. They're looking for the picnic baskets. Yes, yes. those two. <laughs> Um, but hey, hey, no, Brooks, none of this means anything for the Chicago bears this year, but it could, if you want to take that as an omen bears fans, which I look, why not? Maybe the bears are out because it's a big season for Justin Fields. I, I'm all for that. I'm sure that Brooks is all about that. Cause Khalil Herbert's like his, uh, my guy already. Yeah. So, uh, I'm just saying Jay Grizz is. <laughs> I'm looking over my shoulder a little with a little bit more apprehension yeah. than years past. I have never carried bear spray around on me as much as I did this around. last weekend. Oh, I thought you were <laughs> carrying it now. Yeah, I've, no, like, you should have it. But when Jay. I look up and I see a giant grizzly bear, I feel like where's my <laughs> He's bear? He's coming spray? right for us. It's a little different. <laughs> uh, we have an AFC South breakdown episode today. A little bit of news to talk about. A quick question on today's show, and we thank you for joining us once again. On the Fantasy Footballers Podcast, three days a week right now in July. Uh, just got done with a mock draft, including the Deucers. Oh, great success. Saw a lot of positive feedback there. I I came away from the mock, that mock draft very tired. <laughs> um, g doing the narration of a mock draft with six people uh, was more demanding than three. And you guys did a good job. Like Your team was especially well built. Brooks. Thank you. It was a lot of fun. Uh, 
So we just got done with that. We've got a another divisional breakdown today and on Thursday. You can find us on Twitter at the FF Ballers over on TikTok as well, is what I'm told. We're over there. Oh, we're doing great things over there. Um, Jason does a lot of dances, I think. Yeah, I mean, that's sometimes people just, you know, want sexy time. And so well, they, they go there looking for me You're dancing. Classy, bougie, ratchet. Yeah. <laughs> that's that. There you go. Uh, join the foot.com. Is that one still popular? No, no, Mike, it's not, but I enjoy <laughs> no, it. No, because everything is that one stupid song. I'm sure we've done that one, too. We don't know what we've done on TikTok. <laughs> it's really, we'll find out with you. Yeah. We're going to go there after the show and find out what we've done over there. Um, the communities that join the foot.com, I encourage you to check that out. It's an opportunity for you to uh, become a part of, of the Foot Clan. Uh, 30,000 plus, you get access to the Discord server where you can find leagues and people to play with. This is the time of year you're kind of building those leagues out or looking for people to come fill in a spot in your league. Um, a ton of other perks, including the Footcast, an extra weekly episode. And uh, those are always a lot of fun right now, this time of year. Here's the quick question of the day. Michael in Iowa. I lost my league last year. Oh, I'm sorry, Michael. Punishment awaits me. Also, you really lost. Uh, but I also get to choose my draft spot for a 12-team league. Should I take the one spot? And what slot do you prefer to draft from? I have two different answers for that question now because I, in a neutral situation, my favorite spot's the 103. That was, that was going to be my answer. And I just take uh, one of the wide receivers, Chase or Jefferson, or I take McCaffrey. But if I was Michael in Iowa, I would draft him the one spot. Really? I would. I would just take Christian McCaffrey at the one spot, yes. So uh, I am. I personally prefer the 104. Uh, you brought up Jefferson and Chase. I put Cooper Cup right there with them, and then Christian McCaffrey. I want one of those four. What I found uh, just today, I, I joined a new uh, underdog league, and I got the 101, and I was disappointed because I was like, ah, I don't want to. Like I, I was like, do I take Christian McCaffrey again? That's who I usually take at the one on one. Do I? Want, I almost went Jamar Chase. I really didn't care which one of those four I got. Like I, 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 I just experienced that where I was like, I wish I got a better second rounder because I'm just as happy with any of those four. And I've been thinking lately, like maybe we are dumb. Well, that's for that's a given. Well, right, right, right. But maybe we, as an entire fantasy community, are dumb for not having jamar chase be the 101, 101 consideration yeah like the 101 i mean he you know justin jefferson's the best wide receiver you sure about that <laughs> you <laughs> yeah. sure about that I'm because pretty sure I, I know he was the best last year he's obviously amazing i'm not trying to take anything away from justin jefferson but jamar chase you just want him to be considered yeah i mean he's he's I, he's a freak and his quarter he's not having kirk cousins throw him the ball you know, you, How you dare wanna, you? But, you want to talk about a uh, a guy who could level up again. Justin Jefferson's not leveling up from what he did last year, but I can actually see that happening for Jamar Chase. Well, that was just my thought. It yeah, kind no, of, I, sorry, sorry. It kind of reminded on. me when we were questioning, like, Matthew Stafford and Cooper Cup with Sean McVay, like, that should really work. And that's kind of how I feel about this Joe Burrow, Jamar Chase, like, just coming into the prime of their career. Yeah, and it's 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 that type of thinking that makes me want him to take McCaffrey with the one on one. Because you are you were in last place last year. And the the biggest thing that's gonna prevent that this year to me is power at the running back position. We don't we're we like these wide receivers because we've had so much tumult with different running backs. But I feel like the biggest difference maker is I mean, I don't think you guys disagree. If you can lock in a good running back with the position scarcity issue yeah, just, I imagine if you knew that McCaffrey would be what he was last year, that wouldn't be in doubt. Almost every season, the most powerful fantasy asset is a running back. So just they're higher risk. So you know, it's it's hard with Chase because I think I think it's fair to consider him in that spot, but I do, I do wonder why we wouldn't just give Jefferson the nod. Like Chase could level up. Like Jefferson's not going to level up from the finishing at one. But, like, last year Chase was hurt. 
He's never had a ninety yard or ninety reception season, at least. So it does feel like he should, right? He had like eighty seven with injury last year. He was eighty seven thousand forty six and nine. So I no, I I get it. I I don't think you're wrong to do it. I don't think any of us would say that. Chase Jefferson, Cup, McCaffrey, and if you wanted to say Eckler, I think you're fine doing that too. See, I, for me, it's it's Hill. Like I think. We, we've had this discussion a few times, and, and I, I think Tyreek Hill is in that for me. So anywhere from 101 to 105 is where I want to be. I mean, it's if you want to lock in McCaffrey, that I have no problem with that. Go 101. Otherwise, hit that 105, and then you – I mean, your you second think, player, and then you get a little bit of a bump there too. Do you think that essentially you can't screw up with those top, top four? That's what, that, it, that's what it feels like to me. Yeah, I mean, anyone can get injured, but as far as like – Will their ability or talent or situation fall off or change or not be successful for fantasy? No. Barring injury, they're they're locked. All right. I'm going to give you some NFL news I need your thoughts on. This is the uh, kind of the second positive report in this offseason. I mean, there have been um, kind of articles that have followed up events. But Javante Williams, uh, he said himself the plan is for him to be cleared for training camp. He says, I feel like I'm ready to go. It's about the evaluation, how the Broncos feel about it. Just seeing how I feel and how I'm moving. Just trying to get my speed back to normal, things like that. Javante Williams, that storyline is huge because it has an impact on, um, obviously, his ADP, where he's going to go in drafts. Samaj P. Ryan, we trust Sean Payton with the running game. Javante is a very talented player. This recovery never seemed really feasible, but positive report number one. He was participating in OTAs. Positive report number two, he expects to be cleared, not for the season, but for training camp. So we're watching, right? But this would have huge ramifications if, you know, like Adrian Peterson, he was a quick healer from an injury like this and was able to get back out on the field. Yeah, it's part of the whole offseason has been, for me, at least when I'm thinking about Javante Williams, I know that this news is going to happen because this happens with everybody. J.K. Dobbins promised pro like that he would be ready for day one for training camp so much as Ian Rappaport had a source from the Ravens who said he's not going to be there for day one. Rappaport put that out. J.K. Dobbins uh, had some choice words for Rappaport saying, no, I will be there, was not there. And then it's just – then looking at the season of what happened to J.K. Dobbins, because their their injuries are very similar. Like J.K. Dobbins wasn't ready to go uh, at the beginning, then got re hurt, which is a huge problem. That's a huge red flag for Javante Williams. It's not just is he actually ready to go; it's he's ready to go, but the chance that he injures something else in his lower body because of he's still trying to recover from such a devastating knee injury. He becomes he he's a really really risky pick, but I but I know that the news is going to be positive because it's because it's almost always positive of these guys are they're ahead of schedule. He's going to be there for training camp, and then even if he's not there at the beginning of training camp, we expect him soon, and and we're really hopeful he won't be on the pup. Oh, we're we're hopeful he's going to be able to start week one. So it's you gotta when, when you're drafting Javante or Samaj P Ryan, you're you're making your your bet and. I'm going, yes, Adrian Peterson uh, destroyed. The, like, he is yeah, he came back, the standard. He, re, he tore ACL, MCL in like after 12. Last 12, week of the season, It I was think. after 12 weeks, and he rushed for 2,000 yards the next year, but he's not the only one. Frank Gore came back from his ACL two times collegiately, younger. Jamal Charles tore his ACL, came back for 1,500. Sure, but th those were just ACL tears to my memory. I, I just – I want it to uh, – to color in the fact that like if the reports are positive, like we don't want bad reports. So if they're positive and he can play week one, it will be a current surprise to us. I'm saying if, if it was Javon, if Javante had just torn his ACL and not ACL, LCL, uh, what do we got? Posterior lateral corner. Like, I mean, he, he, he wrecked his knee really. Unfortunately, if it were a clean ACL tear, I would be, willing to take the risk on Javante Williams. So does that mean you're out on him regardless of these reports I'm, this, uh, this summer? Currently, yes. Yeah, I, I I actually lean towards Mike's side. 
I mean, obviously, if he's f full participant in all of training camp, then yeah, that, that's, be out the, that's out sure. the window. Uh, you, you look at what's going on with Brees Hall's ADP, and you compare that to Javante's, and it's like no one seems to care that much about Brees Hall. He's fine. He's, you know, a, a very highly drafted pick, and he had, you know, it was a couple weeks difference in the timeline uh, for their injuries. The the big issue here is what Mike was saying. It's it's more than just the ACL. Um, it was a it was a much more egregious injury. Although Brees was more than the ACL as well. I'm I'm guessing that right now Brees's ADP is too high. Javante's ADP is too low. They will settle somewhere. I agree with that. Somewhere nearer to each other. But Brees I, was ACL and meniscus. Right. So it it was a little easier. It wasn't multiple ligaments. Um. But so you know when I look at the bets that you make in fantasy, I find that the best odds is to bet against a guy off of the injury Javante has. Yeah, I, right now that bet is is not an expensive bet. Fair. Yeah, it's not costing right? you a lot. So to, the you know, upside but, represents a lot more than where his ADP is. So, I mean, RB29 on underdog right now, 26 on sleeper. Are you taking Monty over him, Mike? Yes. Rashad White? Ye yeah, probably. Okay. Alexander Madison for sure. Yeah, I, this news wasn't to say – I'm not making a declaration yeah. that he's going to be healthy. This was just passing along a second positive report well, of the offseason to it's say – good conversation. To say keep your eyes open because if he starts making progress, like Mike said, in training camp he looks good. He's taking first-team reps. This is not – I mean, this is going to be like kind of a quick swap, swap to a different mindset for the Denver backfield than I've been approaching it with. Like, I've been looking at Samaj P. Ryan as a value late yeah. in drafts and – if week one is Javante out there, I yeah. don't think the P Ryan value is there anymore at all. No, if if, if that training, it, and, you know, trying to stay water and be willing to, but it's just you're like at this point of this recording, I am I'm not taking him at his ADP. I'm very happy for him if this is the case because it was a it was a major injury. Yeah, and for him, and he's come back. He said, you know, I only have one way that I know how to run with violent intentions. I'm going to be going as hard as I can possibly go. So I do expect if he's back out there to be himself, it's just a matter of, is that four weeks in? Is that three weeks in? Do they take a lot of pressure off of him with P Ryan to start the year? I mean, these are all things we don't know yet. We don't even know what this offense is going to look like under Peyton. So should be interesting. Let's get divisional. Well, it is our second Divisional Breakdown episode this year, talking about offseason changes between 2022 and 23, uh, looking at how these offenses could function today. We're in the AFC South, and uh, we'll close it out like we do every Divisional Breakdown and make our predictions for who's going to win the division, maybe the order of the division like we did last week. Yeah, the order is going to be a little bit more important than the Division winner, I'm guessing, at the end of this episode. We did the AFC North, which we all had Cincinnati winning. I believe both of you went Baltimore as the two. I went Cleveland as the two. Yep. Um, which, actually, you two, you, you two were going opposite of uh, the sports books on that one. Mm -hmm. And then um, you guys had the Browns in the, ba in the basement with Pittsburgh above them. And uh, I obviously, according to Twitter, hate Pittsburgh. And uh, Baltimore. And Baltimore. Don't yeah, forget don't forget that. And Baltimore. Baltimore. Yeah. yeah. And all the teams that I didn't say are going to win the Super Bowl, to be fair. Yeah. Yeah. Hater. Um, last the year Bengals. in the AFC South, the Jacksonville Jaguars won it at nine and eight. Tennessee was seven and ten. Colts four and twelve. Texans three Just and thirteen. Took an overwhelming control of the division. Yeah, this was a bad division last year. Tennessee dealt with uh, significant injuries. They could not get it going. Uh, as the perennial favorite in that division of late. Colts had a disaster of a season. They did everything they could to lose. Yeah, they were bad not just on Sunday, but on Saturday too. And then Houston, 3-13. and 13. So they combined outside of the division to win four times total against playoff teams. That's not good. Yeah, and it was the, uh, what, the Colts, despite having four wins, they had beaten Kansas City in week three. <laughs> Jacksonville were the other three. Uh, they beat the Chargers, Baltimore, and Dallas. So they were 4-21 and against playoff teams last year. So we just talked about one of the best divisions at the AFC North, and, and last year this was one of the worst. So um, 
fantasy points wise, this is worth noting. A good insight here from Kyle. Outside of Jacksonville, wide receiver fantasy points were severely lacking in the division. Jacksonville had the eighth most, right? Because Christian Kirk was pretty darn good. Zay Jones, spot yeah. start. Indianapolis, 20th. Houston, 28th. And Tennessee, 32nd at the wide receiver position. That's how Houston likes it, though. So, I mean, really, you had – but that was still – Vrabel's was, like, I, I can bring that down. It was still, what, Pittman, Brandon Cooks, and then Traylon Burks. Uh, those were the three names we would have been paying attention to. Didn't add up. Yeah, Qu I mean – Quarterback play was a huge part of that. Yeah, the division – sucked you had injuries to Tennessee obviously Indy and Houston were just dumpster fires but we could start with the Jaguars who got good they they are a good team um I know that they're going to be a lot of people's darlings this season but if you remember last year they started two and six they were not that great and then they finished the year eight and three in their final 11 games uh including a five game winning streak and it wasn't a situation where um, you know they just kept accidentally winning the close games. They're, they're one-score games. They were still sub-500. So there's room for improvement here, and the improvement is going to come from T-Law. Uh, Trevor Lawrence either steps up and is a superstar, and then this division is completely owned by him. They all get the Trevor Lawrence tattoo, the long hair, Every team has to get that tattoo on their back because he's. I, I think he's going to own it for a while. Or he isn't a superstar, and you know then this entire division just sucks. You you see that as a binary uh, situation? Yeah, you're, you're pretty black and white about this. Yeah, I, that was. Uh, I mean, couldn't he just be kind of pretty good and then and Tennessee's still take the division? pretty good and it yeah. could be more competitive. I think if he's pretty good and Tennessee's pretty good, then this division still stinks. Um, but I, my belief, I've, I've shared this before. Um, I've, I've drafted this way in my drafts, but I believe Trevor Lawrence is going to do it. I, I think he's going to take this team to the heights that they have really not been at since. Well, like, you're going to get them on showcase week two at home, Kansas city. That's going to be a fun game. They start on the road against Indy. So they'll get to see potentially Anthony Richardson or Gardner Minshew, Nine and eight last year, but ended eight and three. And that's where a lot of the optimism comes from. Uh, the five game winning streak, the playoff victory against the Chargers. Last year, their win total was six and a half. This year, it's at nine and a half. Although it's been bet down from 10 and a half. So um, the division is theirs to, for the taking. That is for sure. Um, Trevor Lawrence showed that he could, in kind of over, not just one game here, one game there, he could step up and and be a fantasy force. And he's going to be one of those quarterbacks in that range. We were in the mock draft on Saturday where it's like, you know, middle rounds, the Trevor Lawrence and Tua and Deshaun Watson. And in, you know, maybe you throw Lamar in there, maybe he's above, but that group of quarterbacks has a lot of upside. Yeah. I mean, I, it's just a matter of who you believe in. I know you like Deshaun Watson a lot. I don't, I like Trevor Lawrence a lot, but that's why they're in those middle rounds. You're trying to take a shot on, upside and talent the reason that I believe in the upside of uh Trevor Lawrence it's not just because he was drafted you know at at the 101 to be a superstar but it, it's because of the coaching staff and the players around him Calvin Ridley we haven't seen in a long time we don't know if he's still great but we do know that he has been a great wide receiver you add him to what you know we just talked about that was the number eight uh wide receiver core last year in fantasy points there's a lot of weapons on this offense, and when you play in this division and you get to play, you know the the Colts and the Texans and the Titans six times, it's a it's a good uh, baseline. Travis Etienne, let's talk about him. Um, last year, explosive, five point one a carry, nine yards per reception. Uh, but the big question mark is, can this Clemson duo that had such a rapport in college? kind of uh, in the passing game, can can that imp be the source of improvement for Travis Etienne? Because only 14% of Lawrence's targets went to running backs last year. That was the second lowest in the NFL. Obviously, he is a mobile quarterback, so when a play breaks down, he's capable of, of kind of, you know, taking off as opposed to dumping it off. But to me, that is an area of opportunity for this offense. It's certainly an opportunity, but now you have um... – 
it, it seems like this is more likely to continue than to see a gigantic increase in targets. ETN targeted on 12.7% of his routes, second worst at the running back position. They bring Tank Bigsby in. This is like Travis ETN is, I think, a a very risky pick, as in the upside is there, but I think that the downside is there as well. The beginning of the year started off. They were the Jaguars were really working James Robinson in, and Robinson was having like Robinson was having fantasy success. He didn't necessarily look fantastic on the field, which is why they eventually pulled him and then traded him away. Uh, but the, it, Travis Etienne took over there. They didn't have another plan because James Robinson was so much in their plans that that Etienne was getting the bulk of the of the work. But I think that Tank Bigsby is a is a threat to put this into far more of a committee. Seemingly the way that, that Doug Peterson has done things, that that's what Doug Peterson would prefer. So that's why I think that your I don't know that the, the targets are going to go up for Travis Etienne. Meanwhile, I believe that Tank Bigsby will take away more work from Etienne than over the second half anyone was taking away from him before. Not not that Etienne will be terrible for fantasy at all, but you know, just rankings wise, our consensus has him six spots below where he's currently being drafted. Uh, he's being drafted as the running back 13. Our consensus have him, has him at 19. Yeah, there was, You didn't mention Dearness Johnson either, or Jermichael Hasty who was involved last year. Yeah, Hasty was involved. They added uh, Dearness Johnson and then obviously spent a pretty high draft pick on Tank the, Bigsby. That's why so, I was focused on Tank. Yeah, and, and, and if you look at the game log for ETN last year, there was a stretch when they realized, oh, James Robinson's toast – and he was gone, that he's playing 80%, 79%, 81%, 78%, 88%, 75%. These are numbers that very few running backs in the league are on the field for that snap percentage. And when they come out and say, we want to get more backs involved so we can keep ET and healthy, and then they go and do it, he's not playing that percentage of snaps. Now, he's super explosive. So when you get a young, explosive guy on a good offense that projects for nine and a half wins, I'm fine with the draft pick, but I don't see him having this show to himself well one of the problems is he only had one touchdown over the last eight weeks of the season and we should remember those first four games last year he was coming off of a major injury that cost him the year before so it made sense that they were going to ease him into the offense all good points that you guys are making calvin ridley we'll find out oh man we'll find out he's 28 turning 29 final year of his rookie deal but he'll join christian kirk and zay jones it does push uh even if you don't, you know, have the confidence to invest a high pick on Ridley, which like you can take that shot, it does push down my expectations for Zay Jones to be a regular contributor with the return of Evan Ingram, with you know Travis Etienne's involvement. You mentioned Bigsby, but Ridley and Kirk, like it seems like predictability on Zay Jones's involvement is going to be very difficult. I would agree. I I think it also personally impacts Evan Ingram. You just add another piece where you're splitting the pie four ways. And Calvin Ridley is someone that I'm willing to take a bet on, but I am also willing to admit I think it's a bad bet in the sense that historically you're talking about a 28-year-old turning 29 who hasn't played in a long time in an offense with other very capable wide receivers. He's being drafted as the clear wide receiver one. You're calling your shot there if you're taking that draft pick, and I'm fine trying that, but I, I do – my advice for most people would be – the odds say that it, it's probably not the right pick. I, yeah, and I don't want to like fully put these two situations together, but like there were huge expectations for the return of Josh Gordon because Josh Gordon had put up the kind of season that was like wide receiver one capable, yes. right? Like his physical ability and his talent, like they're not like parallel circumstances, obviously, but a long wait, finally a return, and then not necessarily like – you know, if Calvin Ridley is number one and the and the go to guy in the most receptions, I won't be surprised. But if he's also just a guy that gets like four targets a game and there there's a bunch of deep threats and they work a bunch of other people into the offense, that wouldn't surprise me either. So there's a lot of potential upside, but he's being drafted fairly high. Yeah, I mean he's a fourth round pick, the wide receiver nineteen. He's being drafted to do it. And I think that there is a world where he ends up as the number one and it's still not good. Like the number one for this offense. But that's just not enough target share with the other guys. And it not only is 
the the part of the story is Calvin Ridley's being drafted for sure. Like the ADP in the crowd says, we know that Calvin Ridley's the guy. Meanwhile, the wide receiver eleven of last year, yep. who still is continuing to get that gigantic bag of money, Christian Kirk is being drafted in the back of the sixth as the wide receiver thirty two, which I I get it. I get that like when I hear about when I think about drafting Christian Kirk, it's not an exciting proposition. But to be the thirty second wide receiver off the board, if if you believe in if, Lawrence, if you believe uh, that's exactly what I was going to say is in many there are many many Trevor Lawrence believers. I think you should be thrilled to get yet another where does value. Where does T Higgins go right now? Third round? Uh, yeah, right around like he's a I think he's in the top twelve or so. So the question is, do you believe in Kirk the way it has the potential to be hey, Higgin, like Higgins, Higgins lights. and Devontae Smith? Like he's not those guys. But if you believe Lawrence can throw for forty five hundred yards, where's it going? Well, I mean, you saw this two years ago where Christian Kirk was the number two for his offense. He was the wide receiver 26 in football, uh, in, in fantasy. So, yeah. that you know, yeah, he that's already out. Good. Yeah, <laughs> he's already out producing, you know, his wide receiver 33 draft cost. One quick Evan Ingram question before we move on, Mike. Would you take him in the eighth round? I'd be willing to, yes. Jason? <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. Quick break back with the Titans. All right, time to move on in the AFC South to the Tennessee Titans. A strange and bewildering sight, 7-10. and 10. A projected win total before last year, a more uh, Mike Vrabel-esque 9.5. And, and this year it's only at 7.5 because there are question marks on this team. It almost feels a little bit like a team hanging on to its identity mm -hmm. from the edge of a cliff, and, and everyone's like, just let go. Just let go. It's over. And then maybe they're like, no, we can we could climb this mountain again. It feels like a really, really nice go-kart that's kind of made out of aluminum foil. <laughs> and you're really hey, worried. It's nice just, and light, man. It, exactly. It's, it, oh, it's going to, you know, the acceleration will be there. Just don't have anything go wrong. Because if you hit a bump, it's all going to collapse. You've got Ryan Tannehill who can be efficient. He can be a good quarterback. Oh, yeah. I've seen oh, it. Yeah. He could also just end up getting benched for Banana Rama. You've got Derrick Henry, one of the best running backs in all of football for the last five, six, seven years. And he's old enough and has enough wear and tear on his tires that it's like that could be this could be the end. This team just seems like best case scenario is they win the division. They're a ten win team. They're super well coached. Bananarama never sees the field and doesn't need to. Worst case scenario is the wheels just fall off and this team could be, you know, by midseason playing for the number one pick. What helps them is the division they're in because I think that they're going to be able to hang on. They started so strong last year and it just fell apart. Do uh, you need to read the numbers? The, the Tennessee Titans finished the season at 7 and 10. Heading into week 12, they were 7 and 3. They were seven and three. They lost seven games in a row to end the season. They had the thir third most. The wheels fell off. Games lost due to injury last yes. year. They also were minus fifty four in fourth quarter point differential, according to Warren Sharp. Um, it was a disaster. But in the midst of it uh, of disaster, which by the way, I believe their offensive line is ranked thirty second after being thirty second last year in the midst of disaster, can sometimes be opportunity. I think Derrick Henry, who's being drafted as the RB7, maybe had the most casual near 2,000 total yard season that anybody has ever had. Mm -hmm. I mean, he had another 349 opportunities on the ground for over 1,500 yards, and, oh, let's just throw in almost 400 receiving yards. So, there – the question of whether Derrick Henry could still end the year as the wider or the running back one, I think, is still. I think the answer is he still could. Absolutely, he could. And the fact that they started getting him involved in the passing game, it, I mean, we've said this forever. Like Derrick Henry is great. He's the only running back on the draft that doesn't catch the ball. Except, what if he does catch the ball? Because he did last year. Uh, you know, prior to last season, he had never been out of the teens in receptions. And then last year, he was at thirty-three receptions. Was was actively involved. Now. 
some of that could have been the fact that they had absolutely no one else to throw the ball to. Traylon Burks was injured. Kyle Phillips was injured. They, there, there just was nobody. Obviously, Robert uh, Woods was there. Was he? Like, 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 like we said, there's, they, they didn't just, really have just, anybody. Just saying. You Robert, sure about that? <laughs> Robert, Robert Woods was on the Allen Robinson plan last year. Yeah. And I mean, he, this he coming had, season. he had 90 targets, Mike. Robert Woods had 92. He caught yeah. 53 of them yeah, he, for 500 yards. That's the – Allen Robinson was like, nice. <laughs> that was a, a great season, Robert. Yeah, so do you think – Join Henry, me. Do you think they found something to get him more involved, or do you think that was just necessity and he'll go back to the teens in receptions? No, I, th I don't think they have other weapons. I mean, they, they have the most bewildering wide receiver room. They're putting a tremendous amount of faith in Traylon Burks, which for a fantasy sake is worth a great – I mean, he's definitely worth a shot. Like, this offense, to succeed with Mike Vrabel, might just need Tannehill, Burks, and Henry to get enough done. If it succeeds, it will be those three. And if that happens, that's fantasy gold. Because whenever you look around at the end of seasons and you see a real valuable asset in fantasy, it's usually very consolidated. You know, it's like yes. Cooper Cup just gets everything. So Traylon Burks, if, if he is, you know, it's him and Henry – that's great for fantasy. And, and because the rest of the wide receiver room is Nick Westbrook, Akine, Kyle Phillips, Chris Moore, and Racy McMath, Chickaconqua will have an opportunity to break into this offense. Yes, he will. And and we've seen um, we've seen success at the tight end position on these rosters before. He's super athletic. He led all tight ends in yards per route run, second in um, targets per route run. I love him. He, he's He's one of those players that I think – just stood out to me towards the end of the season, and uh, I had a quick, quick couple games of watching film on Chigakonkwo to say, this is a wide receiver that's that's running around out there. So it's tough to put a lot of eggs in the 28th ranked point per game offense from last year, and it, it is a uh, it's a machine that if you lose one part. The whole machine's going to break. That that uh, go kart is going to crumble, and it's like you can't take Tannehill out, you can't take Henry out, and you can't take Burks out. No, which like Burks may not be ready for that level of responsibility. He's going to get it. There's not a choice, and and the reports have been very positive. So, um, it just feels like a fragile team. Yeah, I I would agree. I think it is fragile. There's there's value to be had. I would still like. I mean, Traylon Burks right now is the wide receiver thirty five. In ADP, I love that. I've got him as my wide receiver, 25. I'm well ahead of ADP on Traylon Burks. I, Burks or Christian Kirk? I would take Burks. Because they're both uh, drafted go, almost at the same spot. I'd go upside pick of Burks. Okay. Yeah, that's where I would be too. And then just we're, we're, we're way too early, generally speaking, to even consider playoff weeks. However, Yeah, it's worth mentioning. However, double Houston, Seattle, Houston – for Mr. Derrick Henry, should he still be uh, toting the ball in Wait, those so, weeks? So we have to wait for the playoffs to get um, the Houston, Houston Derrick Henry? Mm. I mean, or... That is a you, little sad. Or you get to wait. I mean, That's true. Depend, depends if you've drafted him or not. We'll have to remind people. They might not remember right now. Yeah. The Colts went 4-12. and 12. They had and a 9.5 win total last and year. One, give them their Nine, tie. 4-12-1. Right, this year, the projected win total is six and a half. You taking the over or the under there? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think it's like six or seven, so I think it's a good line. What do you think? I ask the questions yes, here. Yes, Andrew. yes, yes. <laughs> honestly, it's such a great I, line. I will that take I, the over. I, wanted, I will take the I over. wanted to see how you lean there because I, I think that is the right line. The The coaching last season was a purposeful calamity uh, upon this the team. The men were led, Jason. The men were led by Jeff Saturday after they, I believe, <laughs> incorrectly – uh, sacrificed Frank Reich, got rid of him, didn't bring in a head coach to coach this team, and then they went hard after that great pick, which ended up in Anthony Richardson. Yeah, say between Jeff Saturday and Frank Reich, one of the guys is still a head coach in the NFL. <laughs> right. 
and one of the guys never was. So well, they lost the final seven with Saturday after he won his debut, so which she, hurt Mike. I'm sure. Oh, it it was it was tough. It was tough, but we came we came out on top. Everybody, we go ahead, Jason. Shane Steichen's coming over as the new head coach. This was uh, last year's offensive coordinator for Jalen Hurts and the Eagles. It seems like a really nice pairing with Anthony Richardson at quarterback. It's going to be a raw offense. So when I look at the win totals, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking, switching to under. Uh, yeah, I, I really I, am. I lean to the, towards the under with a first time head coach and a very inexperienced and raw quarterback as a rookie who I think will start the vast majority of games. If he's not out there week one, he will be out there soon. Um, and if you're drafting Anthony Richardson, one of the things that it gives you a little bit of comfort is that even if he's not the starter week one, he'll be in on goal line packages. They're going to work him into those games where he's not the starter, so you can have some fantasy points. I'm speaking more of like best ball leagues. Uh, but, yeah, I, I do lean the under for this team. It'll come down to, you know, can Anthony Richardson, if he gets in there, does he run the football? Because we know that's going to be a cheat code in fantasy. There's only four rookie quarterbacks with 600-plus rushing yards ever, and that was Cam, RG3, Josh Allen, and Lamar. But every rookie quarterback over the last 20 years with 80-plus total rushing attempts finished top 10 in fantasy points per game. Don't underestimate that. That's 4.7 carries a game. If Anthony Richardson's starting, I will be shocked that he's not above 4.7 carries a game. And so that's like hiding in plain sight. Ranked, being drafted as the quarterback 12. We've got him lower. We don't know if it'll be Gardner to start. But if he runs the ball more than 4.7 times a game, every single rookie quarterback has been a top 10 in fantasy points per game. And it's also it's what Trey Lance would have been had he got to start as a rookie, who was also a goal line package guy that year so don't underestimate that but it does seem like the like you said the rest of the offense it's it's not impressive Michael Pittman last year he did his best uh, but but it wasn't it wasn't great and you lose Paris Campbell who was a reliable pass catcher in the offense last year and you you replace him with Josh Downs and Isaiah McKenzie so the the ancillary pieces don't excite me. You've got Anthony Richardson, who I think in his own right is going to be awesome for fantasy football. I'm not drafting a ton of him because I think he'll get off to a slow start, but I think I'm going to be picking him up off of waiver wires. If you do draft him, don't drop him to the wire. You look at Josh Allen's rookie season. He started the year just horrendous, worthless for fantasy and yet he finished, like you said, yeah. as a top 10 per game because he ended the year awesome once they figured out how to you know, uh, utilize his skill sets. But he's going to hurt Jonathan Taylor. Jonathan Taylor's going to be good, but not great. He's not going to be the running back one because you're going to have r rushes vultured and you're not going to have Matt Ryan, Phillip River dump-offs. You're going to have Anthony Richardson rollouts. So that hurts. And then Michael Pittman, you're taking a pie that – was you know 4,500 yards or at least 4,000 yards with some of those veteran quarterbacks and you're going down to I don't think he throws for 3,000 yards so if that's the case it's just you're not getting a ton They're even also, if you're 25 percent market share my biggest concern too is like is this the kind of rebirth of the Colts identity as an offense because Jonathan Taylor and Michael Pittman are both in contract years this year Josh Downs was a was a draft pick that they invested in. They have a young Alec Pierce who I think is really talented. So is Michael Pittman a part of the future for the Indianapolis Colts? Because I'd be shocked yeah, that they know. would invest heavily on Michael Pittman as they're trying to turn this roster over and go youth with Anthony Richardson. I think they have to though. I, I, I think I, they I'll will, be shocked if they if they invest. I, I think, think it's Pittman much more likely they bring Jonathan Taylor back on a contract than Michael Pittman. Yes, I, I believe that they need to set Anthony Richardson up for success. They don't have the wide receiver court beyond Pittman, in my opinion, to let Pittman go. They may be in play for Harrison. Sure. I mean, we'll, we'll see how, how, but how you bad can do it goes. both. I mean, you, you get to take advantage of the, the rookie contract. Like when you have a rookie quarterback, that's when you have, you have the room that you can pay or, or overpay, I should say for a wide receiver. Let's spend a minute on Jonathan Taylor before we move on because we, I feel like we've probably 
talked about him. I, I think Jay Grizz is making noise back there. <laughs> Was that Jay Grizz? <laughs> Do Maybe. I have to, what Al? Okay, nope. Get in there. Oh, get, Al. no, get out. You've been called. Get you're, in there. You're on put the, the show camera. now. Yeah, uh, put the yep. camera in Deucer Sally. Oh yeah. Because uh, let me just explain what happened here in the shame. <laughs> Go ahead and hide behind wherever you want. For uh, we're sitting here. We're, I I think we we're probably breaking down this team as excellent as anybody could. Yeah, has ever done. And and then I hear just clank, blonk, <laughs> blank sounds over there. And I'm thinking Brooks is making all the noise. No. And instead, you Al see Borland, me looking over here. who's now hiding behind a bear, was what happened? Somebody explain themselves. He just a, ran into something over here. You ran into something. I was trying to oh. work on something. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I yeah, I did put that the in The other here, deucers sign that we have. Yeah, well, impressive. Good work, Al, making his one contribution to today's show. That was his worst nightmare, by the way. Oh, oh yeah. As you guys know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, he can, you know, we suck it up, buttercup. <laughs> we really enjoy taking as big a bus as you can drive mm. and then mm. rolling that right over your friends mm-hmm. and then backing that up mm-hmm. and then putting it right into You ever drive. seen a quadruple decker bus? Oh, yeah. Because we, dro- we drive it. Squirters. <laughs> Uh, Wait, you know what, what did you say squirt squir- it's like a, a squash squir- except it's way worse <laughs> it's got an r in there yeah squirt um speaking of buses yeah talk about jonathan taylor he for a second a because, bus. Uh, and i'm gonna let mike i'm gonna give you the the moment here because right. jason kind of shared his thoughts about the way this season may play out but jonathan taylor is let's not forget the number six and the number one overall fantasy finisher last year a lost season in a lot of respects due to the injury and re-injury. Yep. So he still ran for four or five a carry. Half of it was on an injured ankle. What Do you agree with Jason's take on his ceiling? Does he not have running back one potential? Because in our mock drafts recently, we've seen him as the second running back off the board. Yeah, right now RB4 in ADP. And I'm not willing to go RB4. I, I, we have him as a top 10 guy, but there's just so many things stacked against him. How good is this team? And because that's compounded by you're going to have a rookie quarterback in there sooner than later. I can't, Maybe Gardner, maybe they give him week one because he gets to go do a, a revenge game against the Jags. But Anthony Richardson is the future of the team, and he'll be in there sooner than later. Anthony Richardson is a mobile quarterback, so that takes away – all the, the like Jason said, the Phillip Rivers checkdowns and the Matt Ryan checkdowns, those will not be flowing for Jonathan Taylor. And then you have goal line being taken away from Johnny Taylor. It, and and running backs just, when a running back is on a a team that's not great, more often than not, it takes away from their fantasy upside because that team's not putting up points. So I am, I'm not concerned at all with Jonathan Taylor's ability but his situation is not great. And for him to be taken as the running back four, I don't think that's factoring in enough of his the situation that he finds himself in. All right, I want to talk about the Texans. Really? And I was going to bring up the fact I think they are going to be much, much better than they were last year. And then I went and I looked, and the projected win total reflects that. So the opinion, last year they were four and a half. This year they're six and a half. That's the same as the Colts. I think they're going to make huge strides this year. C.J. Stroud arrives. Um, The future, I think, is very, very bright with uh, the transition to D'Amico Ryans at head coach who will fix the defense. That's going to happen in Houston. Uh, They invested, obviously, early draft picks um, to bolster the defense, to add a quarterback in C.J. Stroud. Uh, it's been a good offseason. They added Devin Singletary and Mike Boone to the running back room. They added Dalton Schultz as the tight end. They added uh, Robert Woods and Noah Brown, lost Brandon Cooks, a wide receiver, but they also drafted two guys, Nathaniel Dell and Xavier Hutchinson. Well, one one and a half. They drafted because Tank Dell's so teensy tiny. Yeah, he's yeah. he's a so he's to, petite. To me, there's a lot of addition this offseason that I like with Houston, and I. I would take the over on the six and a half. 
I think they'll be a seven-win team this year, and I do not Man. think they'll be the basement dweller. You know what's funny is whether or not this team or the Colts team is going to go over or under probably will be dictated by who wins the series those two of games. those two games. <laughs> like, do do the Texans beat the Colts in their matchups or vice versa? Um, th this team should be signif significantly better. Will Anderson on defense, uh, they traded back up to grab, you know, it was like, oh, are they going to take Will Anderson? Are they going to take C.J. Stroud? Why not both? Yeah. Um, and thank you for that, by the way, as a Cardinal fan, because <laughs> I want, uh, want a good pick next year. Um, I would take the under on the Texans. I think that the elite talent, if I, if I had to say who's going to win the heads up matchup between the Colts and the Texans, I think the Colts win those games. But for fantasy purposes here, there's a lot of question marks. Damian Pierce last season was a revelation. He was the best fourth round rookie running back that we have seen ever, uh, or at least back to 2000 where, you know, most of my data comes from, but he wasn't. He he was really good on film. He was uh really good for total fantasy points, but there there were a lot of problems and inefficiencies there too for having an offensive line that is very expensive and and should be good. This now is a new regime that comes in and they bring in Devin Singletary as a free agent. This team is not heavily invested in Damian Pierce, so and and Damian Pierce last year when he was having great success, he was it. He was the his market share of the running back room was a stranglehold over the position. So I find myself pretty much out on Damian Pierce, even though I loved the film last year. I don't know if you guys agree or disagree with that. I, I think I'm, that there's an argument to be made on both sides. Yeah, I'm okay with the draft price. Like, I, I think Damian Pierce is a, is a much better running back than Devin Singletary. I think both will be involved. And I think he overperformed because of what you said, the, the amount of volume – you know, you talk about it, it's the, it's the Travis Etienne argument to a degree where uh, because of the, situa the situation they were in, the snap counts were extremely high. Um, you know, the, this was the running back 13 from weeks 3 through 13. So we know he can get it done for fantasy. And last year's team, Houston, they were 30th in points per game. This is not a good team, 31st in total yards, and yet he ran very, very hard. That's what he does. He's a violent, vicious runner. Singletary is much more... I think at this stage of his career, uh, a tried and true runner, a guy that just gets the job done. And, um, but I think there's a difference between them. And so, you know, if you believe that, like the sports books say, that they're going to be a little bit better this year, can you be a, you know, can you improve that points per game as a team overall, or are you going to be stuck because of this rookie quarterback? It will That's be a big question. It will be interesting because this is now like you know this is this is Central America. The, in the middle of the country, but it's San Francisco. Like these are like D'Amico coming over from San Francisco. Bobby Sloak, the offensive coordinator, has been a Shanahan guy. Like since 2017 when Kyle Shanahan was the head coach of the 49ers, Bobby has been there, uh, you know, in one way or the other. He started as a defensive quality control, but then he moved into an offensive assistant, then a passing game specialist. And the... The Shanahan system, if he's going to bring that run scheme over, very valuable. The like we we see a lot of players who you don't think they're like oh that that's just a that's a jag running back. You put him in the Shanahan system, and incredible things happen. But also for Kyle Shanahan, before McCaffrey, this would be a running a very very running back by committee, and you don't even necessarily know for sure who's going to have what role at what time. So I think that that needs to also be a, a factor of if you're, if you're looking at Damian Pierce, he needs, he needs an overwhelming amount of volume, and I don't think he's going to get that. Now, it, running back 27, that's not an ADP that says he's for sure going to be locked in and do what he did last year. So maybe he's worth that draft price. But no, no, it, no. He's, it's, he's the running back 19 right now. We have him. Oh, we have. Oh, as I'm sorry. The running back 27. Okay. Uh, flip that. Reverse I actually, it. I, I, I read the RB 27 as ADP as well when I said that I would. Oh, approve did we? That whoops. I would approve that. Oh, whoops, a doozles. Uh, I would approve an RB 27 ADP. Yeah, but that's, that's not why where, I agree. That's with not that. where we are, <laughs> apparently. I, and if he's going in the fifth, there's going to be other players at different positions I want more than him. Yeah, and I, I do want to say, uh, yes, they're spending a ton of money on their offensive line. No, it wasn't good last year. That's true. So um, if that can improve, 
if he can get into the end zone more, I think he only had what four touchdowns or something. Um, those would be areas where efficiency would, it, it would transform that a little bit. You know, you have reason to be confident in the running game in general because of the things you talked about coming over from San Francisco. So I think this team is going to be fun to watch. And I think that there are underrated options elsewhere. I think Nico Collins, which in so far in practices is by far the number one target. I think he has some sneaky value. I mean, he's not being considered in any draft, which is he's wild. Not. It's wild because you have some of these offenses where like, you know, they they get to play the same amount of uh, opportunities that the other team does. You know, Carolina, Houston, this division's awful or was last year. You know, there, there's going to be spot start opportunities for players like Jonathan Mingo or Nico Collins or Adam Thielen. Um, and I, I just don't want them to be forgotten about. I think sure. Dalton Schultz is underrated. Yeah, I, I think it's it's worth knowing the names because you then you have John Mechie who was – uh, a second round pick out of Alabama this past year, unfortunately had to deal with his health issues, but he's back. He's good to go. And and Robert Woods is there to at least give some a veteran presence. So yeah, I I don't mind bringing them up just so everyone's cool and and aware of what's going on with the Texans. But we we've you know harped on rookie quarterbacks don't carry a a good fantasy starter, let alone like a top 36 option most of the time. And I love CJ Stroud. Look, believe me, he was, he was my, my guy, but 70% of rookie quarterbacks don't support a top 36 wide receiver. And so that makes it like, th these are, these are long shots, but I don't expect any of these guys to have regular value each and every week. Yeah. I mean, you, you just said it 70% of rookie quarterbacks to start week one. They don't ha have a top 36 wide receiver. So you're already talking about a 30% outlier, you know, sliver that do have them. And those players aren't the Nico Collins and Robert Woods get, of the world. They get massive, massive Keenan Allen volume. They, exactly. He, it would have, we, Nico Collins would have to see a, like a 25 plus percent target share to even get close to being inside that top 30. All right. Give me your division top to bottom. I, I'm going with the Jaguars at top. Uh, I think that the, the go-kart is just too dangerous here um, in Tennessee, but I'll take Tennessee second, the Colts third, and I'm, I'm going to put the, the Texans at the bottom. I will go Titans, take the division. Ooh. Uh, I think it just it all fell apart there. I mean, to start seven and three and then fall apart, I think, they, I think they can get it going again. Jags easily in second, and then I'll take – I'll go C.J. Stroud and company at third and the Colts at, at the bottom. That is my order. Tennessee oh, winning man. the division, Jacksonville, Houston, Colts. I think Derrick Henry's got one more. I, yeah, I do I, too. I, I love I it. I, I don't know what the the odds are, but I it's, would imagine that it – Jacksonville's the favorite. No, but I, I would imagine they're – Plus 425 for Tennessee. It's a good exactly. bet. It's a good bet. Plus 425. Yeah, that's – Mike, that's, you want to get together after this and yeah, take we'll, care uh, of that? Yeah, what is it with? In the parking lot. Oh, okay. That's <laughs> Yeah, not on uh, NFL. Take it off not on NFL place. grounds. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, Brooks. Out of curiosity, who do you have winning the division? Let's hear from you. I got the Jags. Okay. Right. Boring. Yeah. I regret asking. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Yeah. I look. Jacksonville to me is it's a lot like Detroit. I'm rooting for them. But Doug Peterson teams do they? Does it wear off? You know, first season is always great. Does it wear off with Doug Peterson? Is is Trevor know. Lawrence got it? I hope so. But Tennessee is the uh, – Tennessee's still the giant to kill. I think if they're at full strength, that's going to be an intimidating couple of games for Jacksonville. If they beat them, they're going to win the division, right? Yeah. If they, well, they're an are, insane I, – I, I don't know if we mentioned this, but an insane stat. Ryan Tannehill, despite everything that's gone on in the career of Ryan Tannehill, since two, uh, 2019 when he became the starter – for the Titans, he has won over sixty-five percent of his games. There are certain teams and He's certain an coaches, guy. <laughs> coaches that they they get their players to play tougher. Baltimore is going to play tougher. The 49ers, they just hit so hard. That's probably why they're all injured all the time, <laughs> perhaps. And and Tennessee, they just are they're brutalizers under Vrabel. And so I don't, I, I certainly don't blame you uh, thinking that they could win the division. Check out the Ultimate Draft Kit to get an edge on your upcoming 
fantasy football drafts, everything you need to dominate, including a cheat sheet creator, sleepers, breakouts, a whole lot more at ultimatedraftkit.com. Until next time. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FF Ballers.